fine. Okay, so uh, I'm Mr. Sarkar, and welcome to APCSA. And I wanted to take about a half hour and tell you a little bit about the course because this AP class is kind of unusual and extremely different from most of the other AP classes you've had, and it's very different from AP Computer Science Principles, which most of you have had. Uh, if you haven't had it, by the way, that's perfectly okay. Uh, you need either like really good grades or AP Computer Science Principles to take this class, and if you have both, obviously, then you're a step ahead of the game. So I wanted to start off by asking you a couple of weird questions. They took a poll of AP students, and they asked, like, if you were to rank the level of difficulty of all the AP exams, what would you say would be the hardest? And what do you think the answer is? And I'll give you a hint, it's not a computer science AP. Anybody want to guess what is the hardest of all the APs? Yes, sir? Probably a math class. Uh, you would think so, but strangely, no. In fact, BC Calculus, which a lot of people say as the answer, is probably not even in the top four or five. Yes, miss? Physics one. Not physics one, nope. Yes. Probably history. No. <laughs> Maybe chemistry? No. <laughs> physics C? Physics C. Calculus-based <laughs> physics is way harder than the other AP exams. Okay, that's just a fact of life. And so if, we was gonna, if I was going to draw a spectrum of uh, AP difficulty levels with like really easy stuff over here and really hard stuff over here, I would put physics C right at, at the very right of the spectrum like that. Now, you probably don't know this, but the easiest one that they voted on, and I have no personal experience, I'm not trying to degrade this particular course because I don't know anything about it, but they say environmental is the easiest of the AP exams. I don't know. Okay, now, uh, raise your hand if you took AP Computer Science Principles last year. Most people here, okay. In this spectrum, where do you think AP Computer Science Principles ranks? What do you think? Yes, sir, what do you think? Right next to it, in fact. It's basically been voted the second easiest of all the AP exams. Okay? Now, we're going to talk a little bit about APCSA today. And we're going to try and figure out where it lands in this spectrum right here. And in order to figure that out, I'm going to share some statistics with you. And I'm going to also get you to try to understand what what shapes of student grades typically look like. So let's run a little experiment. I'm going to go outside. I'm going to grab 100 students at random, right? Grab 100 of them, drag them in here, and give them some test. Doesn't really matter which test, strangely enough. English test, history test, math test, pretty much any test. And let's say I was to grade their exams, right? And it's like a pretty general exam, like stuff you would expect the average person to know, right? And let's say I was to graph the distribution of their grades, right? So I've got this graph here. And here I have the grades, right? So here are the numbers. Like, so this, these people got a 40, a 50, a 60, 70. You get the idea, right? And this will be the frequency, like how many people got that grade, right? And if I was to do this, uh, the, the shape of the curve would be remarkably consistent, pretty much independent of subject. What would be the shape of that curve? Ms. Shuzan? It would be a bell curve. Some of you have taken statistics already. Some of you have not. By the way, as a little aside, by far the most important course for you to take while you're at high school, AP statistics. No matter what you want to do in life, you need that course. Um, anyway, so it would be a bell curve like this. So there would be some average, right? This is the average, right? And then there would be half the people would be, you know, better, and there's some people like really good, and then some people not so good, right? So that would be like that. Now, I will, uh, it'd be interesting to know what does like a typical AP exam look like? So I think you had mentioned um, a BC calculus. So let's look at BC calculus. So now there are only so many grades possible on an AP exam. Okay, question, have you ever heard any of your buddies tell you they got a zero on an AP test? Has that ever happened? Is it possible to get a zero on an AP test? There's only one thing you need to do to avoid getting a zero on an AP test. What is the one thing that the College Board cares about more than anything else? Yes, miss? 
Nope. More important than that. You're close. Oh. Anybody else want to take a guess? Yes. Just answer the question. Much more important, yes. Pay the money. Once you pay the money, you can't get a zero anymore. You now immediately are launched into this one through five range right here. Okay? Now, it may interest you to know that if I was to plot the frequency of the scores on BC Calculus, they would look like this. Okay? And my question to you now is, why is this not a bell curve like this? There's one really important reason. I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and discuss why this curve looks like this when I told you that if I grab 100 random people out there and give them a test, most of the time it looks like this. Why does this curve not look like this? Okay, Mr. Burnett, any ideas, sir, how come this doesn't look like a bell curve? Uh, it's, not 100 it's not random. Right? These aren't random kids. Who are these kids? Well, yeah, but there's something unusual about these kids at West Hill. What's unusual about them? They're the smartest kids in the school. Right? Now look around here. Are you an average group of West Hill students? What do you think? What do you think, miss? No. You're the smartest kids in the school. And what you need to understand is that in every school in the country, when they're taking computer science A, it's not a random sample. The smartest kids in the school are, are going into that class and taking that class. You understand that, right? OK, so keep that in mind. Now. I will tell you also that this course has been around for like forever, like 35 years, something like that. Five years ago, the College Board made a change to the exam, and I'll talk about that. It had nothing to do with COVID. This was before COVID. They made a change, and that caused a shift in the, in the grading. But prior to that, so for the first 30 years that this course was around, one of these grades was always the most popular grade on the AP CSA exam every single year. Now, in math, when we talk about the popularity of numbers, when we have a bunch of numbers and we say, which one is the most popular, that has a special name in math. What do we call it when it's the most popular number? Mr. Mitty, do you know, sir? The mode. So what I want you to discuss with your partner is for the first 30 years that this exam was around, what do you think was the mode on the APCSA exam? Okay, I realize I haven't given you a whole lot of information, but we're going to vote. We're going to vote on what you think was the most popular grade for 30 years in a row on the AP exam, CSA. How many people think five was the most popular grade? Anyone? No one. Okay. How many people think four is the most popular grade? One, two, three, three people. Okay. How about a three? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people. Two? One person. One? Okay. You will be surprised to learn for the first 30 years of this test, every single year, the mode on this exam was a one. 24% of the students approximately that took the test got a one on this exam. Now keep in mind, these are the smartest kids in the school. They've taken Java for an entire year, right? They go in and take the test, quarter of them fail. Anyone guess why? The test is really hard, okay? The test is way, way more difficult than most of the other AP tests. In fact, if I was going to draw that continuum of difficulty, where do you think CSA lands? Take a guess. Yes? Next to BC. 
Right, no, not next to BC, sir. BC is not a difficult CS oh, okay. AP exam. What do you think? <laughs> huh? Uh, physics. Next to physics C. AP CSA is the second hardest of all the AP exams. Now, the other thing that I need to explain to you is that if I was to take 100 random kids out there, dragged them in here, and gave them some sort of generic computer science test, not a Java test, because they'd all get zeros because they haven't learned Java. But if I gave them like a generic computer science test, the curve would not look like this. Because computer science is one of the few subjects that does not produce bell curves when random samples are created. The curve for computer science almost always looks like this. OK? This is called an inverted bell curve for obvious reasons. And it has led some psych psychologists to conclude that there's a part of your brain where you com comprehend computer science. And some people are born with an innate ability to understand computer science. And some people are not. And that it is extremely difficult to go from here to here. And if you were to look at the distribution of grades on the AP exam, it supports this. And for the first 30 years, the grades came out like this. So this would be a 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, like that. And you can see that the mode was a 1. And the College Board was extremely unhappy about this. And very few people took the CSA exam. About 70,000 kids in the country, uh, to put that in perspective, the number of students that take, I think, AP English is like 800,000 or something, right? So 70,000 is a drop in the bucket. And the College Board is really unhappy about this. It says, hey, this is no good. Now, why do you suppose the College Board is unhappy? Right. They want to drive big volume so they can make more money, right? So if you take the test, they make money, right? So they're like, what can we do to get more kids to take APCSA? So they asked the teachers. They said, if you were us, what would you change about the exam to make the exam more friendly, get more kids to take the course, et cetera? And what the teachers said and what the College Board did was they took 15 minutes out of the essay portion of the test and moved those 15 minutes to the multiple choice portion of the test. And what ended up happening is that this curve changed. And now it looks like this. So can anyone guess what has been the mode on the AP exam for the last five years? Five. A five. OK, you see that, right? But can you see that the ones is still a really large number? Let me show you the national results. Um, I'm going to sh go to West Hill. This is uh, the computer science website. And you can see these are the national results here for CSA and CSP. CSA is the one I'm talking about today. And you can see that the national results here show that the 5 is the mode. You see 24% of people in the, in the country get the 4 of the 5. But you can see, look how close the 1 is. You see that? There's still a huge spike. Now, I want you to notice something. You notice that West Hills distribution doesn't look like this. So this thing I was showing you here these are the national stats. That's not the West Hill population. Okay? The West Hill population does much better on the APCSA test than what this curve looks like. I'm telling you this because that's really good news, right? But here's the thing. In order to get this, in order to turn this curve into this curve, we have to do a few things in this class to get you across what I call the bridge. And that's what I want to talk about now. So the way I describe this,
is like a movie that many of you have seen already. You see, the gods of computer science are about to hand you a superpower. Now, you might think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. Computer science is the only engineering field where all you need is that computer and your imagination, and you can build anything. See, my dad was a civil engineer, and he was a really good civil engineer. But if he didn't have steel to work with, he couldn't build a building. See that? But you, once you master programming, you can build anything. All you need is that machine and your brain, and that's it. So it's a unique field. It's the closest thing to Harry Potter that exists in this world, because literally you cast a spell, and something that didn't exist before comes into being. You see that? And not only that, but if you keep practicing, and you don't let your programming skills atrophy, you can keep this skill from now until the day you die. But the gods of programming demand a terrible sacrifice in order to give you this superpower. You have to give up the thing that you love the most. What is that? At your age in high school, what's the thing that you treasure the most? Mr. Dominic? Free time. Your free time! So here is the quid pro quo. The, the, the programming gods are willing to give you this superpower, but you have to give me 20 to 30 minutes of your time four or five times a week. That's a huge commitment. But of course, if you're going to get handed a superpower, it's not just going to be handed to you. Everybody in the world would be doing it then, right? There's a million jobs that are going unfilled right now in computer science because there aren't enough programmers. So obviously, it can't be that easy. But if you're willing to make that commitment and give me a certain amount of your time, now I realize it can't be every single day because tomorrow, let's say, you've got a big science project due and you can't work on your programming that day. I completely get that. But it's got to be a steady drumbeat of 20 to 30 minutes a day. Here's the scenario to avoid. You've got a big project due on Monday. You waited till Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening to get started, and now you're going to work for six hours straight to get that project done. Your brain won't learn anything. You probably won't get done. That is a disaster scenario. If you instead you take 20 to 30 minutes and work on that project over several days, not only will you comprehend the material better, you'll get done on time, it'll be high quality, everything will change. So therefore, the single biggest criteria for success in this class is self-discipline. If you can have the discipline to put in a little bit of time every single day or close to every day, you are going to succeed in my class. And if you're one of these students who procrastinates or maybe you don't do all your assignments, disaster. You see what you're up against, right? Look, look. It, it's a hard test. So now I, I refer to this as the bridge. Let me, this will be the last thing I'll say, and then we'll go back in the lab and sign up for some tools. If I was to plot time, and how much you know, right? In a typical subject, let's say English or whatever, it would look like this. So you take the class, as time goes by, you learn more stuff, right? Makes sense. This is what it looks like in my class. APCSA, it looks like that, okay? <clears throat> so you struggle, you struggle, you struggle, then this happens, and all of a sudden you get it and you come into class after this event happens and everything is easier. The tests are easier, the quizzes are easier, writing the programs is easier. Takes you less than half the time as when you were over here. And I know what you're wondering. What causes this to happen? This is my 10th year of teaching this course and I have no idea what happens here. No clue. What I do know though is that the harder you work, the cl closer this dot will move to the left, and you'll get your moment, of, your epiphany moment, where you're like, oh, I finally get it now. Literally what happens is you go to sleep on a Friday night, not having a clue as to how to do computer science, and you wake up on Monday morning over here, and you're like, oh, this is not so hard. I don't know why I was struggling so much before. Oh, you just do it like this, and there you go. Some of you, this point will be just like a month from now, 
Most of you will be right around Christmas. Some of you will cause me some agita and this won't happen until like two weeks before the AP test. Regrettably, there will also be about five to 10% of you who will not reach this point by the time the AP exam takes place. Now, I'm gonna try my very darndest to what I, drag you over to this side. I refer to this like a bridge. So imagine there's some land over here and land over here, and then there's a short bridge here. I call this part of the bridge the yet part of the bridge. Can anyone guess what this part is called? Anyone? Yes, sir. No. That's called the not yet part. Most of you, with the exception of Mr. Evan and maybe one or two others, are all here. There's already a couple of you here, but most of you are here. My job is to bring you over this bridge. Most of you will join me holding hands gently and coming over in a nice casual walk. A few I have to drag across kicking and screaming. Okay, But my job before that test happens in early May is to drag as many of you over to this side and I can usually get more than 90% of the class to join me on this island here. Okay, So you think about whether you're willing to make this a commitment and keep in mind that only 25% of you will end up majoring or minoring in computer science in college. That's what my statistics show. That's still a huge number, by the way, when you consider how many majors there are out there. But here's the thing I need you to understand. If you're going for a STEM career, any STEM career, biology, mathematics, whatever it is, chances are in the 21st century you're going to need to do some programming to make yourself a better professional. Let's say you're going to be a botanist or a biologist. Computational biology is a huge part of biology now. Okay? All the STEM careers are merging with computer science. Okay, I've talked enough. Let's go next door and... Um, tradition when you take a Java class for the first time that the first program that you write introduces yourself to the world. So we're going to write a simple program today called the Hello World program. It's a tradition. And so in keeping with that tradition, I'm going to ask you to start up Blue Jay. Now you can see the little Blue Jay on the bottom left of my screen right here. Let me drag it over here. That's the Blue Jay moniker. If you don't see this Blue Jay moniker on your uh, on your screen, you can also look for Blue Jay by typing Blue Jay, B L U E, and then the letter J on the bottom of this screen, and that will bring up the Blue Jay moniker also. And then you can just double click on that, and that will fire up the Blue Jay. So you can see I've been working on a project recently, that's why it's up here like this. Uh, you probably have not been working on a project, so you're going to get a blank screen. The other thing we have to do is we have to set up a folder where our program is going to be housed. So the other thing we're going to do is we're going to open up an Internet Explorer window, sorry, a uh, file explorer window. That's this thing right here on the bottom. You can see there's a little folder icon. And what we're going to do is we're going to navigate our way over to your number drive. Now, my number drive actually has my name on it, but your number drive will just have your student ID number on it. And what you want to do is you want to create a folder inside this number drive, call it either Blue Jay stuff or Blue Jay folder or something like that. So you just come over to this white space, you right mouse click, and you say new folder. Okay, I'll do that for you again. So you just go to this white space here, you right mouse click and say new folder and then once you create the folder you can change the name of it to blue jay folder or blue jay stuff and that's going to hold all your programs this year the advantage of having it in the number drive versus having it on the desktop is that if there's a virus on these machines and they wipe the desktops clean you will not lose access to the files on your number drive so it's just a little bit safer place is there anyone here who can't access the number drive if you can't access the number drive, you're going to have to put the folder on the desktop. Okay, so, so far we've created a folder and we've started up the Blue Jay. We're going to create a brand new project on Blue Jay. So we're going to come over here to the project tab and say new project. And we want to make sure that this location right here is set to that number drive folder 
that we just set up, you can see that mine is pointing. So if I wanted to start over, I could go over here and have it point to that folder, say select folder. And now you can see it's going to put all the programs in that folder. And we want to create a brand new project. We're going to call this the hello project. I'm going to call, now I'm going to call mine hello 1B. That's because I got several of these, but you can just call yours hello. Okay, and I've capitalized it. The way you capitalize doesn't really matter that much for new projects. You don't want to have any spaces in the project name, though. Okay, I don't know if that's allowed or not, but it's not a good idea. We'll just keep it all together. And then you just hit OK, and that will create your window. If you have two windows open now, you want to close the old ones just so that you have this fresh, clean piece of paper to work with. And what we're going to do now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What, what, can you tell me your name? Uh, oh, you're um, OK. So I have a seat, sir, uh, anywhere on this side of the room. And I need you to lock it. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. How can I help you? Uh, Mr. Evan, can you help me? Uh, tell me your name again. Alan. 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 Alex, sorry, Alex. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start a brand new project on Blue Jay. So we're going to say project, new project, and we're going to call ours the Hello Project. So just call it Hello. I'm calling mine Hello 1B because I've got several of these, but you can just call your Blue Jay Project Hello. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a brand new class, and that's going to hold our program. So I'm going to hit new class. Now, this part is important. You want to capitalize all your classes in Java. That's really an important rule. So I'm going to call this capital hello like that. And now you can see I've got my little class with uh, nothing in it at the moment. You see these little slashy bars, these slashy bars basically means that I have not compiled my program yet. We'll talk uh, on Wednesday about what that means. Right now, though, we're just going to open up this puppy right here by double-clicking on it. And I'm going to ask you to put your name and today's date in here for documentation purposes. That way, if you ever look at this program later, you'll know who wrote it and also when it was written. Okay. Now you can see they've got all this boilerplate stuff in here. We don't need any of this today. So I'm going to delete everything except the curly brackets. And so when you're <clears throat> with me here, you want to do the same thing. And you want to get to this position where it just says the public class hello and the open and the close curly brackets. And we're going to hit this compile button on the top left. I want to show you there's another compile button over here. They both work just as well. Uh, you can use either one. This one will compile the current class. This one, if you press it, will compile all the classes here. But right now, there's just one of them. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to write an extremely simple program. Uh, but right now, I need to know if anyone has any red ink on their screen that they're having trouble getting rid of in this program. Right now, I just have this bare bones skeleton. If you have any red ink that you're having trouble getting rid of, raise your hand and Mr. Roth will come and help you. Otherwise, when you hit the compile button, you should get a message down here saying that there are no syntax errors. Okay, so let us go and write our little two line program. We're going to say public static void main string args like that. Now, I want to make a couple of points here. You'll notice that there are different kinds of brackets we use in Java. You've got yourself these curly brackets that basically begin and end a block of code. You've got these little sharp brackets that indicate lists. And you've got these regular parentheses that indicate methods. So it's important you use the right kind of bracket. The capitalization is also really important. So far, I've only capitalized two words, this hello and this string. And the reason that they're capitalized is they're classes. This is a class that we're writing. This is a class that is in the existing Java library. So we get to use it for free. 
There's only going to be one more line in our program, and that's going to be system. Notice system is also a class. Out, print LN. Now, that is the letter L. That is not the number one, okay? And this basically says print what I'm going to say and then go to the next line. That's basically what that command is. And we're going to just put hello world in here just like this. And I want you to write it just the way I've written it. You'll notice that when I open and quote, close quotes, it turns green to indicate that this is a string. And that's basically our entire program. We're going to hit the compile button one more time. And if you have any red ink on your screen right now that you can't get rid of, raise your hand and I will launch Mr. Evan to help you. Miss Mullen, do you need Mr. Evans' help or no? Okay. Mr. Evan, I'm just going to ask you to stand yeah. up and periscope on and look and see. Yeah. Just look from back here to see if anyone needs any help. Yeah. Okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to run this puppy in a few minutes as soon as. Uh, all right. We're going to run this puppy now. And to do that, we have to make sure we've compiled it. It says there are no syntax errors. We're going to minimize this window for a second. And we're going to come back to over here, which is the main console for BlueJ. We're going to run it from here. I'm going to take my mouse and I'm going to put it at the center of the box. And when I do so, you see that the arrow turns into a hand you see that arrow hand like that and i'm going to right mouse click and i'm going to select this main method that we just wrote now blue jay is asking me do i need to tell it the names of any files in order to run this program and i don't mr roth can you go sit over there for the rest of the period sir right next to mr alex I'm going to do that for you again. So I'm going to take my mouse. I'm going to put it in the center of the box. And I'm going to right mouse click and pick the main method. And now I'm over here where it's asking me if I need to tell it any file names. And I don't. So I'm just going to hit the OK button. And right now you can see that my hello world will show up on my screen here. And I need to go around now and check to make sure that every single student has this hello world on their screen. going to help you in a second, sir. Mr. Roth, I need you to help this entire back row here. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you to run it again. So we're going to come over here. We're going to right mouse click and we're going to run it again. Now you notice that I'm getting two of these. I don't want that. I want it to clear the screen each time it runs. So I'm going to go over here to the options, and I'm going to make sure that this option is turned on by clicking on it. And now you notice that there's a little check mark next to that option. And so now the next time that I run the program, you see I only get one of these, and that's what I want. I only want one of those. Okay. All right. So now I've written a program. Now it's your turn to write a program. So we're going to write another project now. So we're going to come over here, go to project, say new project. We're going to print a copy of the American flag. So we're going to call this project flag. The little class will be called flag and the project will be called flag. I'm going to call it flag 1B. You can just call yours flag. And there is the project for the flag. This other project, hello, we were working on, is just going to confuse us. So I'm going to shut that down and come over to this flag project here. We're going to start a new class. We're going to call it flag. It's going to be capitalized. And in here, we're going to open it up by double clicking on it. We're going to put our name again. And. We're going to put today's date again. And I'm going to delete all the boilerplate. And now let's see who's been paying attention as I ask you, what are the magic words of Java for my program? Mr. Kevin. 
Sir, do you remember the magic words that I used? You can cheat and look at it if you want in your old program, sir. Go ahead. Public static void main. It'll be helpful if you say it to yourself while you're typing it, then it's going to be string args. This is your only homework today is to memorize this one line of code. Public static void main string args. And in here, we're going to start to print an American flag. System out print LN. And the top of the flag will probably look something like this. And then the next line might look something like this. Maybe put some stars in there. And then maybe like uh, a line and then maybe like a, uh, a stripe like that. Now, if I run this puppy by hitting compile, minimizing the window, bringing my mouse to the center, right mouse click main, I've got the beginnings of an American flag. It's not finished yet. I want you to finish it right now. And I'm going to show you what an American flag looks like. You can see there's one right next to the board in the front of the room there. In case you're not familiar, 50 stars and 13 stripes. And it can't be ugly. Make sure you don't draw an ugly flag, otherwise I'll make you do it again. 50 stars and 13 stripes. You've got about 10 minutes to draw me a flag, and then we're gonna go next door and I'll tell you a little bit about the course. Right now, I'd like you to finish up this flag, and when you're ready, Raise your hand and it's either Mr. Evan or I. Oh, no. Please log on to your computers. If you've logged off, turn your computers back on. We're going to start up in one minute again. I would like you to make your way over to my favorite website. This is the computer science website for West Hill. It's called westhillcs.com, westhillcs.com. I'd like you to go there now, please. And if you ever get lost in terms of trying to find your textbook or your other course materials, the links will always be provided on this site. So you might want to bookmark this site. Now, if you go down here and scroll down a little bit, you'll see that there are nine courses described here that make up the Computer Science Academy of West Hill. And you are taking the, 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 the top tier represent the intro level courses at the school, and then these represent the advanced courses. And down here, these represent the courses taught by the business and science departments, uh, basically the courses that I don't know very much about, but here, you're taking CSA right now. And you'll notice that unlike the other courses, one of the things that's unusual about CSA is that there are two textbooks. So this is your CS Awesome textbook, and this is your lab workbook, which contains your labs. This other little symbol here, which is the sun, uh, represents your summer assignment. And so now if you click on here, it will take you to the summer assignment. And here is the summer assignment for CSA. You have to create an account on code.org and you have to go and do this CS Fundamentals Express course and you have to complete 85% of it. Can I see a show of hands of how many students have not completed the summer assignment? Not completed, okay. You, I'll give you an additional two weeks from today to finish it and then two weeks from now, I'm going to ask you to log on to code.org and I'll be standing over your left shoulder, not your right shoulder, your left shoulder, and asking you to show me that you have completed 85% of the summer work. And that will be a graded assignment, okay? It's a graded assignment, so you got two weeks to finish that. Okay, so moving on, uh, let's go back to our main page. Mr. Uh, uh, Acton, have you done the summer assignment, sir? No. Okay. So have a seat, go to westhillcs.com. And if you go to westhillcs.com, sir, you'll get to this page right here. 
And look over here, sir. Look, see this sun symbol here on the under APCSA? That's the summer assignment. I'm going to grade it two weeks from now, okay? You got two weeks to finish the summer assignment. All right, so getting back to the home page, we're going to look at our two textbooks now. We're going to look at the lab workbook first, which is this purple book. So let's click on that. And you'll see that the, you see, notice that there are 10, well, they're actually 11, but there are 10 numbered units here, one through 10. And these represent the 10 units that are part of this course as are numbered by the College Board. The College Board has these numbers, one through 10 for each unit in the course. And the first unit is primitive types, and that's what we're starting on Wednesday. Uh, but here are all the projects for each unit. Right now, I'm more interested in this getting ready unit. So let's click on that. And there's a single page here. Now, if you're going to use your personal laptop computer or a school issued laptop, you need to install both Java as well as BlueJ on your machine. If you want to use a Mac computer, Java already comes pre installed. You only need to install the BlueJ on a Mac. On a Windows machine, you need to install both. So if you intend to do some of your work on your laptop, or maybe your parents have a large desktop at home that you want to use, you have to install these two pieces of software in order to run the programs that we do in class. Right now, I have a rather mundane assignment for you to do, which is to create logins on each of these tools. They're all online tools. Unfortunately, they don't work with each other. I want to give you a word of caution about setting up your accounts on these and other logins. It will be preferable if you use your personal email address and not your school email when you set up these accounts. And the reason why is that if you lose your password, they're going to email you a new one. And if you use your school account to set up your logins, they're going to get blocked when they send you email because your school email address only gets email from other people inside the school. And so to set up these accounts, I strongly recommend you use your personal Gmail or other email address. The other thing is, if you lose your password, I can't help you. So you should keep notes on your phone with your password information for these sites. It's not a good idea to use the same password, but if you do so, no one will know. But you need to keep track of these. We're going to use them frequently. You can't afford to keep losing your password. So the first one we're going to set up is the most complicated one, which is your other textbook, which is the RuneStone textbook. Let's click on the RuneStone link, and it will take you here. And what you want to do is sign up for a RuneStone uh, 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 RuneStone is, it provides access to lots of computer science and other textbooks online. So you need to click on this link up here to sign up. When you put in your username, I recommend using the number from school, your student ID, but you can use anything else that you like. You fill in the rest of this information for your email. I recommend your personal email. You've got to fill in the password. And then when you get to this course name, really important, you want to go West Hill CSA 2223. Okay, that part has to be exact. Then you click on the I have accepted. And then you do not want to check this box. This is to make a brand new course. You don't want that. Now, after you get past this screen, it's going to ask you for money. You want to press the orange no button. Remember that for the rest of your life. When they ask you for money, you press the orange no button. Please set up your RuneStone registration now and register for this course. So RuneStone has several courses. You're signing up for both RuneStone and the West Hill CSA course. I mentioned that you need some discipline in this course. The main area where you need discipline is for this RuneStone course because these are going to be long dated assignments. I'm going to tell you, okay, unit one is due three weeks or four weeks from now, and you have to have it done by then. And 
One of the great things about this textbook, unlike your other textbooks, well, a couple of great things. First, if there is ever a mistake, it gets fixed overnight because it's online. The other great thing about it is that it's interactive. So when they give you a Java programming problem, you literally go in the textbook, you write the solution, you press the button, and the textbook runs the program and tells you if you did it right or not. Yeah, I don't know of any other courses in the school where the textbook is this interactive. So it's a fantastic resource. The person who wrote it is a personal friend of mine, Beryl Hoffman. She's a professor at Elms College, and she works very hard on keeping this textbook up to date and error free. And it's a fantastic resource for Computer Science A. Okay. Is there anyone that is struggling getting their RuneStone account working and signing up for the West Hill CSA course? Can you go help Miss Ishita over there? Most of you hopefully have managed to log in. Once you do so, it will be taking you to this course right here called the CS Awesome APCSA course. And you'll notice that there are 10 units here and the numbering of the units in this course are identical to the numbering by the College Board. So you can see this follows the College Board curriculum carefully. And if you feel really excited about this course and want to get a head start, you can start working on Unit 1 as early as this evening. Unit 1 is going to be due probably in about three weeks. Yes, Mr. Burnett. So somewhere up there, if you click on this little man, we'll show you a change course. And you want to enroll in a new course. And you want to say the West Hills is a most of you will be following along with me throughout the year. There will be a few of you who will want to race ahead of me. And to you, I say, go get them. And in order to do that, you can run as far as and fast as you like in, in this textbook, okay? You don't have to stay with me. But if you want to run ahead of me, you can do that. And we're going to cover this entire book, and it's going to be all 10 sections. I should mention that uh, this book, the only things you're not going to do in here are the large projects. And the reason why is that we're going to use separate large projects. But the mini programming assignments you do and all the other stuff you do, you can skip the large programming projects, however. Okay? All right. We're going to go back to our CSA, uh, this, this uh, lab textbook, which basically has all the things we want to set up. The next thing we're going to set up is this coding bat account. So if you click on that, or you can also go over here and type in coding bat into a browser and it will take you there. Okay. And what you want to do here is set up an account here. And what you want to do is click on this create account and set it up. There's a few other things I'm going to ask you to do here. So go ahead and set up this account and I'll show you how to turn on teacher sharing. So please go to coding bat now, Alex, and turn on your get an account and get ready to turn on teacher sharing. Hopefully, you've managed to create an account on CodingBat. What I need you to do now is from the home page, I need you to click on this Preferences tab. And that will bring up this page right here. And there are two things you need to fill out. Down here, where it says Memo, you need to put your first and last names. Please do not type my name in the memo field. I already know my name. You need to put in your name.
The other thing you need to do is turn on teacher sharing so I can see your work. So in here, you need to put Mr. Sarkar's email address, which is written on the whiteboard in front of you, csarkar at stanfordct.gov. Okay, then you hit the update memo button, you hit the share button, and we are good to go. So your name over here, Mr. Sarkar's email address over here. And to see if you've done a good job, I'm going to go over to my report generator and see how many students have followed my directions correctly and have signed up for their account and their teacher sharing. So let's see here. Mr. Jimenez, you appear to already be here from last year, sir. Do you remember your password and everything? Excellent. Looks like I need to clean this out from last year. Ms. Benhaki, I think I see you here already. I don't know if you just made this account or it's from last year. Do you remember your password, Miss? Yes. Okay, very good. Let's see here. Maybe one of the new kids. Uh, Mr. Acton, have you managed to turn on your teacher sharing? Yeah. Do a little refresh here. No, no, no. A K T A K H. Yeah. There's there you are right there. And there's your brother right there also. Mr. Mitty, are you on here, sir? M I B Y. There you are, sir. Okay. Is there anyone who has not made it to my magic screen? Is everyone here? Okay, Mr. Dominico, right? There you are, sir. Okay, everyone feel comfortable that they've managed to do the job right? Let's go on to the next one. So, so far we've logged into our CS Awesome textbook. We've created a coding bad account. Practice it is similar, except there's no teacher share. So click on practice it. You can also come over here and look for practice it on Google. And it's built by the University of Washington. So you just go there and you click on the create account. Now, practice it has two modes. It has the free mode and the paid mode. Take a guess which mode we're gonna use. The free mode, because Mr. Sarkar is really cheap. You'll learn that over the course of the year, just how cheap he is. Right now, just remember that he doesn't pay for anything. So you're gonna sign up for the free version. The free version doesn't have teacher share. Oh well, what can you do? But you still sign up for this. I have no way to tell if you've signed up for it. I just have to take your word for it. When I assign work on here, though, I'll be checking by walking up to you and standing where? Left shoulder. And you'll have to show me that you finished the assignment. Okay. Please finish signing up for practice it now. And we're going to go on to the next one. The next one is going to be, we're going to create an account on this thing called the CS Auto Grader. And if you click on that, it'll take you here. And believe it or not, this entire system was built by one of my students last year. I sat down with them and said, hey, you know, it'd be really nice if I could have a piece of software to grade the students' projects. And he said, oh, coming right up, Mr. Sarkar. And then two months later, he built this thing. Yikes. Anyway, you want to click on the login button here and then uh, hit the registration button. It's going to ask you for two pieces of information. You need a school code and a class code. Can anyone guess where those two pieces of information may be found? Google Classroom. So in case you haven't already done so, you should join my Google Classroom. Let's go there and see what's going on over there. Here's Google Classroom. And if you join my CSA class 20, uh, and you, this is the code to join my Google Classroom, by the way, in case you haven't done that. 
But if you look in the Google Classroom, you'll see that the school code and the class code that you need for uh, the joining the CSA auto grade, the joining the CS auto grader are, are given to you there and you should cut and paste them. I'm going to go on to the auto grader now to see who has followed my instructions and who has not. Okay, uh, let's see here. Now I've got two classes mixed in here because I'm too lazy to make separate sections. But I see Mr. Dominic Baker has already joined in. That's a good sign. Let's see who else. Yes, miss. Uh, you can add another course. So if you go to the main page, uh and then uh, are you able to get in using your old password miss no then you have to create a whole new account make sure you put on your phone or somewhere all the credentials so you don't want to keep losing your password every few weeks because you're gonna lose your assignments okay let's see who has successfully managed to Mr. Jack Bellow has managed to join on. Yes. I don't really know, miss. Uh, let's see. Hold on one second. Maybe I can do it. Hold on. Edit class. Let's see here. No, that's not it. Uh, maybe over here. Uh, hold on. Hold on. Uh, Super, no, that's not me. Uh, dashboard, no, that's not it. Settings, settings. I can change my password. Can you change your password? Oh, right. Well, that's a bit of a catch 22, isn't it? Well, let's try again here. Uh, super admin. It says I'm not authorized. Let's see. It seemed that this would be really an important feature. Oh, I know. I got to go to students. Duh. Okay, here we go. Go to students. And then, here we go. Here we go. Okay, what do you want me to do? Oh, no, but you're not here. This is the stupidest system I've ever seen. I, I don't know. How, oh, I, I don't know how to do it, Miss. I uh, should make a new account. Oh. Yeah, use your school email. Just the hell with it. Oh, I can reset your password if you're already on here. But if you're not in the class, I can't reset it. Hold on one second. Maybe I can reset it from your old class. Uh, oh, it's not here anymore. This just gets worse and worse. Make a new account. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. I think we have one or two more to do. Yes, sir. Mr. Roth is going to come and help you, sir. Okay, let's go back to our list of things. Oh, we need one more, which is lead code. So go to lead code. I got to tell you about lead code and uh, click on this create account on lead code and create an account there. Sorry, which which one are you having trouble with, sir? Auto grader. Okay, so what's the issue? Try. G do you have a Gmail account, sir? So just make one for this account, okay? 
Okay. Please go to Leap Code now if you've done all the other ones and create an account on Leap Code. Normally, I give you five minutes of free time at the end. Today, the class is running long, unfortunately, so you're only going to get like two minutes. I got to tell you about Leap Code. Leap Code is not an educational tool. Leap Code is for professional programmers to use to practice coding before job interviews. So the problems in here are really, really hard. So we'll only be using a small fraction of them for our course. But if you are one of the few students who ends up being addicted to programming, there are a lot of things worse in this world to be addicted to, by the way. But if you end up being one of the glitterati in my class, this is the place you can go if you feel like Mr. Sarkar's stuff is too easy. Okay, so this is where all the high-end assignments can be. If you want to really flex your programming muscles beyond what we're learning in the classroom, this is the place for you. Okay, so hopefully you have created all five accounts here on these systems. They don't play with each other, but they're all used throughout the course. We now have three minutes left before the bell. This is your time to text your mom and let her know that you're safe. She hasn't heard from you in over an hour and she's concerned about you. On Wednesday, we're going to start unit one on our textbook and I'm going to teach you about variables and primitives and all kinds of things like that. Congratulations, you've made it through your first day of APCSA. It was my pleasure to host you.